the day may have been cloudy or may have had blue skies. We're not sure. On that day, the birds may have been chirping, the dogs may have been barking, the flowers may be, have been budding, we don't know. But what we do know on that day is there was screams and accusations and finger pointing and eyes directed at a sobbing woman, probably indecent, being drug out in the public square and thrown into the dust for all to see. Some may have mocked, but mostly we are told there was blood curling screaming as men gripped a hold of rocks with simply two words of vigilante justice. The two words, stone her. She had no time to gather herself, no time to speak one word in her defense, and no time to cry out for mercy. Stone her. Kill her. Destroy her, was the cry. She had, after all, been caught in the act of sleeping with another woman's man. That was indisputable. And now she was going to pay. But we do not know her name. We do not know her age. We do not know if she was wise to the fact that she, in that moment, was being used as a pawn in a much bigger game. Her accusers, who should have been her helpers, didn't ask her to explain herself. They didn't bother to cover up her indecency. They didn't examine her with their own lustful hearts. And while this is going on, a man like no other comes and dares ask the rabble-rousers a question. The question is, who among you is without sin. And the, the declarative, he who is without sin, then go ahead and throw the first rock. Only stones dropping to the ground, were told, was the thing that interrupted the stunned silence. We know from biblical records that they were so eager to kill in defense of the law, yet at the same time we're told in Matthew and Mark's account that while they were doing that, they were in violation of the law themselves. They were, of course, quick to tithe, even the smallest amount of herbs, while at the same time had neglected the weightiest amount of the law, mercy. This group demonstrated the truth that legalism fails every time it is tried in human relationships. Legalism has no interest at all in reducing burdens on people, but rather actually adds to the burdens without offering any assistance to relieve them. It places and exposes these burdens on the people whom they weigh down. Legalism, after all, would have a man remain sick and not be healed so long as it wasn't on the Sabbath. Legalism would neglect one's own family while at the same time claiming to be priests of their own home. Legalism and all of its illegitimate cousins are the termites of relationships, particularly gospel ones. Sadly, their specie did not end with Jesus. At the Council of Jerusalem, upon which the letter to Galatians heavily leans on as a matter of context, the fundamental issue at that council in Acts 15 is, are the Gentiles and the Jews members of the same family of God by entry into the same gospel? If the answer is yes, they are, 
then the Gentiles would no longer be required to adhere to the Mosaic law. In other words, Gentiles would no longer be required to become Jews in order to become into Abraham's family, which is what is its central to the debate. You might recall there are grand speeches at the Council of Jerusalem. James, the Lord's brother, the chief apostle of the Church of Jerusalem, stands up to speak, as does Peter. And in Peter's masterful speech of the Old Testament redemptive history and its application of Jesus, he says something about what these legalists are trying to pull. Notice what he says in Acts chapter 15, verse 10. Now, therefore, why do you put God to the test by placing on the neck of the disciples a yoke which neither our fathers nor we are able to bear? What a picture. Legalism puts an unable to bear yoke on the necks of gospel relationships. In Jesus' time, in Peter's time, in Paul's time, and even in our own, legalism fails every time it is tried. It has no interest in reducing burdens, but rather actually places burdens on people without any help and assistance to remove it. Now, coming out of Galatians chapter 5, where we have this amazing lists of the fruit of the Spirit and the fruit of the flesh, now we come into the final lap of Paul's letter, where now he applies... In the context of relationships, your theology. I said that last time. The greatest way to know if you really believe your doctrine or not is live with it in relationships. And how we treat one another in the body demonstrates do we really believe the gospel of Jesus? Or is it just we're gospel in name only? And that is the application now when we come to chapter 6. And brothers and sisters, you and I, you can come up here and preach now. One of, if not the greatest way, we will see how we live and how we behave is when each of us sin. Because if you're in a family, it doesn't take very long to know what you really have. Not your image of a family, but you really have. I'm sure it stunned the lovely and gracious Anita when she woke up the day after our honeymoon and found out I had bad breath. What in the world is this? My knight in shining armor is... And the longer we're together in the body of Christ, guess what? We're going to sin. And that is perhaps the greatest way we get to tell, are we going to be a gospel-centered church or not? And that's what Paul comes to today in Galatians chapter 6. Two paradoxes, you'll notice the paradox in verse 2 and in verse 5 when he says the same thing in completely different ways. But how do we live and make mention of the gospel at Calvary Baptist Church? How do we ensure that legalism, that the Judaizer troublemaker syndrome does not infect us? Number one, in verses one through three, Paul wants to screw into our conscience that we must learn this principle, we are each other's business. I remember when I first came to Calvary uh, 18 years ago, I wanted to get to know people, so I took them out to lunch and um, did interviews with them. I thought, I can get away with this when I'm, you know, uh, the new kid. 
And I'll never forget uh, in interviewing a lady, and my interviews went the same. I wanted to know, are these people Christians? And so I would ask everyone, are you a Christian? Tell me about your Christianity. And I'll never forget early on asking a lady this, and she says, well, I'm a Baptist. As if asking her, and she was very insulted that I would dare as a pastor, let alone a brother in Christ, inquire if she was a Christian or not. And I can't quite remember because she's gone now. Did she even <laughs> answer my question? She was hung up on the temerity of my question. And the point being, we are each other's business in the family. So that's the first thing. You'll notice as Paul leads, he uses vocative language. He's not talking to the troublemakers now. He's saying, brothers and sisters, the ones who are spiritual. It, it's like me, you know, saying, Roberta and Travis, I'm directing my attention to people. And Paul now is talking now to the real gospel people in the church of, uh, of Galatia. Brothers and sisters, spirit, this is a family issue. And most of the bulk is not to the person sinning but it's to the church and their response to the sinner, as so often as it is in Paul's letters. So we must know our responsibility that we are each other's business. Well, what is the business here? If a person is discovered in some sin, ah, there you go. Guess what? We're all not squeaky clean. Guess what? We're all not all perfect. You've heard that, haven't you, about the church? I don't want to join the church. The church is a bunch of hypocrites. Yeah, right, come on in, there's room for one more. I, I mean, of course not. And so if a person sins, now much has been made about this, so we need to do some digging on how this is described. Uh, this word for sin is not the common word for sin. It is an obscure one. And it's used primarily uh, for a word when people took trips in the first century world. They would go to places where the roads would not be, they would be poorly constructed. One of the wonderful things the Romans gave the world is Roman roads, a highway system. So you could get to places quicker. But if you were in the, the, the country, in the farming districts, and uh, the spring snows, uh, the winter snows from the spring began to thaw. You get ruts in a road and you take your wagon, your cart would sink. Your mule could be in danger of breaking a leg and you could get out and one false step, you'd fall on your face with these crooked, jagged roads. By the way, those were the places where thieves would hang out because they knew you were vulnerable. Not long ago, during fall formal season, I happened to be at, uh, at um, Crown Center, no, not Crown Center, Town Center Plaza, and I saw some young ladies in their beautiful uh, fall formal attire wearing stilettos. And if you know this section, uh, the wife and I go to sushi out there a lot, there's this section of cobblestone streets. And here are these young ladies trying to do a balancing act with their stilettos. Every false move is a potential ankle breaker. And it was hilarious to see, but that's the image here of one false step. In fact, the word for fall into sin literally is translated a false step. It's not the common word for sin of missing the mark. It's a blunder, a, a step that you make and you've missed it and you now fall on your face. And the implication later is, here is someone in the family of God that didn't mean to do this. It wasn't premeditated, but they fell into sin and now they can't get out of it. So that's the scenario here. What is the responsibility then of the family? First, it's not to turn our backs and say, this is none of our beeswax. That actually is verse 3. That's arrogance. To say that you're better than that, and that can never touch you so you won't get involved. Paul will have some words to say about that. That's exactly what the legalists do. But as a church, guess what we're told to do? Out of gospel love, we recognize people do fall into sin. This is what sinners do. And so our responsibility is a battering ram of three. First, 
restore that person in a spirit of gentleness. The word restore is an old medical term in the Greco-Roman world. Uh, 90% of the time, at least in my research, it is used for someone when they break a bone, they break a limb, and so it is then recast so that they would be healed. This word for restore here in verse 1 was used throughout the Gospels when the disciples' fishing nets would be ripped and they would restore them. So in both the medical and the fishing context, we have the same thing. We have something that is broke, a limb, a net. And what happens is we don't just cast it off. We don't cut off our limb and say, you can live without it. And the disciples don't say, "Ah, let's throw this away and go to Walmart and get a new one. No, they mend it up. They repair it. Why? Because it's salvageable. It's worth mending. And we want to mend it to bring it back to its original functionality. And so Paul is saying the job of a church is when one of you sins is not to push them out and to let them go and drift on their own. When they lapse into a false step, your job is to come around them to mend them and heal them to bring them back to their original state. This explains, or verse 2 then explains this, carry one another's burdens. And in this way, you fulfill, ah, Paul picking a fight with this language, the law of Christ. I'm not sure the Judaizers would appreciate that much by not saying the law of Moses. Now Paul says, let me give you a new law to live by. Help sinners in your family. Restore them. And instead of placing burdens on their back, which is the job of the Judaizers and what they're doing with circumcision, food laws, who we can eat with, and all this sort of mumbo jumbo, relieve burdens of people. Burden here, weight. And verse 3, For if anyone thinks he is something, when he is nothing, he deceives himself. I mentioned it a moment ago. But here the idea is someone who stands aloof to the situation and thinks it's none of my business or begins to surmise, well, I would never do that. I don't know what their problem is. Paul says that's not care. That's arrogance. It is much to be preferred to get involved and help out your brother or sister that has made a false step than to sit around from afar thinking that you're above it. That is haughtiness. So there presents a danger. So then we have a negative application, I suppose. If we are to relieve people's burdens, then Calvary... As a family, our job should be to be made sure we don't put burdens on people. You know, some people are good at that. They can add to our problems. They're called the Judaizers in the first century. What did Jesus say of them, remember? These are the people who will tie up heavy loads and then place them on men's shoulders. So see this description of a burden. That's what they do with all their rules. But I'm telling you, in the body of Christ, whatever you do, don't add to people's burdens, but rather relieve their false steps. The Pharisees were shocked at the woman's sin of adultery. But if they put their money where their mouth is, they should have been the first to help her and remove it and be merciful. Brothers and sisters, our job, our responsibility is to handle and help with members of the family. Luther would describe the church as a hospital of sin-sick souls. So perhaps verses 1, 2, and 3, if you want a metaphorical picture, that's the picture of the church, a hospital. We got sick people, okay? Just, that's what you go. We got sick people that sin. Guess what? We're going to sin. That's what we do until we're liberated from this world. And as a church, we're a hospital to restore and heal sin-sick sinners. 
You have heard of the cliché, the church is good at shooting their own wounded. Gandhi, for whether it's right or wrong, I don't know if he actually said this, but it's attributed to him, I would believe in Christianity if it weren't for Christians. We are our brother's keeper. And they tie up heavy loads and lay them on men's shoulders. Blessed be the tide that binds our hearts in Christian love. The fellowship of kindred minds is like to that above. We share our mutual woes, our mutual burdens bear, and often for each other flows the sympathizing tear. Now, there is a delicate balance between verses 1 through 3 and 4 and 5. In verse 2, we are told to bear one another's burdens, but now in verse 5, we're told everyone should carry their own burden. So what is Paul getting at? That comes to exhortation number two. Mind your own business. So exhortation number one is we are each other's business, but now so we don't go to an extreme, which I find a species growing in the church unlike I've ever seen before since being a boy. And if I've seen one, I've seen a hundred of them. More of that in a moment as we apply Verse 4 and 5, Paul now says each one should examine their own work. Then they can take pride or take glory in themselves and not compare himself with someone else. For each one must carry his own load. The metaphor here that Paul uses is that of a building architect, a builder, who goes in after they built the building and they inspect their work and they get a seal from the city, a stamp from the city of job well done. And that's what Paul is saying. Hey, look at your own life and make sure that you're on the straight and narrow. No one is there to do it for you. And of course, this is a warning that Paul places and Jesus places throughout the Gospels of making sure we take care of ourselves. The religious establishment didn't do a good job of that. They're trying to pull the toothpick out of one's eye when a telephone pole is sticking out of their own. They, of course, as I said before, are making sure that they're trying to all do Sabbath rules while being cruel to people who were sick on the Sabbath. So they need to take care of their own business. My dad had a fond way of telling me that because I was the youngest by a lot in my family. So I could not defend myself physically, so I had to do it with my wit and my charm with my parents. And if you're the youngest, you learn quickly to be a tattletale, basically for protection. And so I would go to a tattletale, and usually it worked on my mom, because I was the baby, and there was not going to be another like me, so she, you know, was sort of mommy's boy for a few years. Uh, But my dad had a funny way of saying, now, Brizey, the first person you've got at mind is yourself. If Brian, and he'd always use the third person. If Brian minds his own business, and once Brian gets all of his business minded, then maybe Brian can mind Terry and Rod's business. But until Brian minds his business, then maybe he should keep his trap shut. So that was his way of saying, you know, stop being a tattletale. I've learned to despise tattletales because I used to be one and, and it took my father's motivational tactics through discipline to remove me of that scourge. There is a trend growing in Christianity. I have seen it. I have seen it building both as a pastor and especially as a pastor, and it troubles me. I think it is a mirror of the culture, but now the pew has to deal with it. And that is a specie, and it goes something like this. I come into the church, or we'll just say I come into Calvary Baptist, And I have a sin problem. And the church rallies around me or I stay at that church for a time and then I eventually leave that church because I'm hurt, disappointed, whatever. And soon and very soon from this species, you're going to hear two things. If I've heard it once, I've heard it a hundred times. I don't care who the person is, their age, what they look like, doesn't matter. It's the same species. 
And it goes like this. Number one, two things are going to be true. Number one, they're going to be the victim. And number two, the church is going to be the bad guy every time. So I'll hear things like, well, the church just isn't loving. They just didn't serve me. They, didn't, they weren't friendly enough. They weren't accommodating. And I will think, and I know that person, and I know long how they've been here, and I'll think, well, okay. Granted, can we be more loving? Of course. Can I pray more? Yes. Can I be more holy? Yes. Can I evangelize? Yes. But God isn't expecting perfection. We'll never get there, this side of glory. But I know that the church has reached out to you. I know that they have loved on you. And what this is, is a defense mechanism that verses 4 and 5 is helpful to say, mind your own business and grow up. You are responsible for your own spirituality. The church didn't put a gun to their, your head saying, now, now you sin. You did it. So don't blame the church for your own immaturity. And this is Paul's balance now, that the church must be involved in people's lives, but understanding at the end of the day, we sing solo at the great triumphal of Jesus. We don't sing in an ensemble. Each one of us will stand before the judgment seat of Christ to give an account. And you can whine and moan all you want. The church was that loving. And Jesus is going to say, did you really know me? Grow up. And so Paul is this great balance of church, know your responsibility. You need to be minding bus your business of your family and taking care. But also on the balance, you are responsible for your own care. Now, while our dear brother Ramesh, in his words, forgot the forgiveness portion of the service, <laughs> thank God Jesus does it, right? <laughs> so he comes on a forgiving mercy mission. When I grew up in my backyard, my parents, when they moved in the 1960s to this house, had a clothesline in the back of the house. Does anyone under the age of 40 not know what a clothesline is? Raise your hand. Okay. All the young kids are looking at me like a cow looking at me. What? 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 Can I? We had a clothesline. We had four clotheslines, two poles, 25 feet in diameter length, excuse me. Now we weren't Amish, okay? <laughs> so we did it, we had made peace with our machines inside to blow hot air on our clothes. But my mom came from a long line of clothesline pedigree. So the line was never taken down until after I became my height and had to mow at night and was clotheslined, literally. My mom liked the smell of fresh sheets from the breeze, so we had a clothesline. Now, many of the kids in our neighborhood who did not have clothesline in the summer would see our uh, sheets flapping in the wind and mistake our house for the circus. But nevertheless, uh, we had a clothesline. It, was, was, it had benefits. It was nice to fall asleep on spring and summer nights to sun-dried sheets and sleep comfortably. But our clothesline was so long uh, and so many that you could actually dry your entire laundry, your, a week of laundry in one setting. Volunteer morning glories would climb up the two poles. All this was nice till people from our church would come visit us and my parents would take them in the backyard because we had chairs erected at, and they would sit under our maple tree and in front of that maple tree was our clothesline. You can imagine my shock and horror when B. Gallimore, my first grade teacher, would come and find out that I wore underoos <laughs> as our underwear flapped in the breeze. I wonder, did pe church people go home and shudder at us Alberts? Did the sight hamper our Christian walk with them? 
They certainly knew we were human after seeing all of our skivvies out there flapping in the breeze. The clothesline is a good lesson to me from Galatians to recall. Do we love people for who they are? or for the image we want them to be. A big problem in human relationships is that we do fall in love with an image rather than real people, skivvies, flapping in the wind and all. God forbid that our underwear should show, that our masks should slip, that we find out that here at Calvary Baptist, my God, in his name, we are actually human after all which means we sin. The woman in adultery knew this truth and was about to die for it. But then along comes Jesus and made his way over and sat down in the midst of her exposed sin in her life open before all, just like he does with us knowing our sin, knowing our pain. Rather, Jesus does to us and whispers to us what he did to the woman. I don't condemn you. Come to me, all who are heavy burdened and I will give you rest. Take my yoke on you and learn from me, for my yoke is easy and my burden is light, and you'll learn that I am gentle and humble in heart. Well, here's to Calvary Baptist. Going to learn to live like Jesus. Father, I thank you for this people Lord, I pray now, uh, Father, we've now got to go live this sermon in relationships and everyday life. Help us to realize that we do sin and help us to realize that we do need you and help us to realize that beautiful song that we sang a moment ago. When others help, when other helpers fail and comforts flee, Help of the helpless, oh, abide with me. That is our only hope, sweet Jesus, is you. In your name and for your sake, amen.